Okay, guys, those of you who've been watching previously will have seen that uh, a couple of weeks ago, I spent a fair bit of time rewiring the body loom of the entire Al Ferrari. It had no wires in it at all, so I had to go through and rewire everything, except the engine. Um, I decided to keep the two looms separate, so there's a body loom and then there's an engine loom, just to keep things uh, simple. And uh, in this case, the Ferrari engine is um, going to be my next challenge. If you missed those previous episodes, I'll put a link up above so you can catch up. And think about subscribing. If you haven't, it does help us out. Um, so why am I going aftermarket ECU uh, with the Ferrari engine? And there's good reasons for that. Basically, the, uh, the Ferrari originally ran dual ECU. So it basically ran like two four cylinders. Um, these ECUs now are no longer made and are actually very valuable because they uh, have a habit of uh, dying and there's no way to reprint them. Apparently they're quite a complicated thing. Uh, Sam Crack, if you check out his channel, uh, has had a lot of issues with these things and uh, as such, these things have become quite valuable to Ferrari owners who uh, have an ECU that dies and wants to replace them. So thankfully I have two of them, uh, which I can now sell to help recover some of the costs of this crazy build. So that brings me to the Link ECU. So um, as uh, those of you who've been watching the channel will have seen that I've actually wired up a couple of these things now. I'm actually uh, getting my head around how this engine wiring goes and uh, it's less of a mystery than it appears. You see, a million wires like this and you go, oh no, there's no way I can ever hack to handle this. But it isn't as complicated as it first appears. If you break it down and do one thing at a time, it actually be begins to make sense. As I mentioned, I've done a couple of these things now. Uh, I've wired it into Harry, I've wired it into the Rockster and uh, both of them actually run, which is uh, which is really amazes me. And uh, the, uh, the link system makes it really easy. Basically what I'm looking at now is uh, I've mounted my Link ECU. I've done the uh, mounting plate in underneath the dash that I did in the previous episode. So now I need to work out how I'm gonna get the wires from there through to the engine bay. All right, so I just started drilling some holes through the firewall, which is where I'm gonna run my wires for the engine through into the ECU, which is mounted just behind here. But uh, I realized that I can't actually do it while the engine's in the car. I'm gonna have to wait until I remove the engine again. But at least now I know where I'm gonna run my, uh, my bulkhead through. And what, the way I'm going to connect it is using some of these things. And these are some Raceworks bulkhead connectors. So uh, I use these on, the, uh, on Harry and on the Rockster. Basically, it's, it's a good way of uh, obviously running wires through a firewall, but also it makes it nice and easy to remove the engine again when you want to take it out, because all you have to do is, uh, is just unplug this and all the wires stay with the engine and uh, you don't actually have to sort of plug a million things in at, at each time. So that's the way I'm going to set it up. The other benefit of doing things this way is uh, particularly with an existing engine, and it's the same as I did on the Rockster, is I can actually use the uh, original wiring with of the Ferrari engine and join it in the middle with the Link ECU wiring, which I will show you in a little bit. For starters, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a bit of a mock-up mount so that I know where these bulkhead connectors sit and mount it to the engine so that when I take the engine out, it's still lined up with where the wires need to go so that I can do all the wiring outside of the car and I don't actually have to be have you know working over the engine bay trying to get around the engine when it is uh, in like this. So let's start making a bit of a, uh, a mock-up firewall mount and uh, you'll see what I mean when I get into it. Alright, so you can see this frame that I've built here, that is exactly where my two bulkhead connectors are going to go in. And uh, I just welded it onto a little bracket that bolts it onto the side of the engine, so when I take the engine out, I still have the exact location of my bulkhead connectors. 
All right, well, um, everything is marked out, so I think it's that time again. It's time to take the engine out again. <sighs> Ends out again. Um, it gets harder and harder to pull it in and out each time because I've got more and more stuff connected to it. So having the, uh, like this time, the exhaust and the tail shaft and, uh, and then fuel lines and all sorts of stuff that are all connected now, it just makes the job much more difficult. But the engine is out. So now it's time to get the original Ferrari wiring loom and reconnect it up where it connects up with the existing stuff that I currently have. Let's do that first. After a lot of head scratching, I've managed to plug in all of the uh, Ferrari loom again and worked out uh, everything I'm going to use. Thankfully, this engine doesn't actually have too much extra fluff like the, uh, the Audi did. Uh, when I say fluff, I mean all of this sort of extra emission stuff that the Audi has that uh, was much more complicated. This is surprisingly a relatively simple setup as far as uh, most of this stuff goes. Um, it does have variable valve timing, same as what the Audi did. And for those of you who, don't, who never actually understood how it worked, because I never really did, um, I knew it changed cams, and I thought for somehow that it would like sort of slide the cam along or slide a lifter along and, and change where, uh, to another lobe, but that's not actually how it works at all. Uh, basically, you've got the two cams in the end, and they're joined by a chain and that chain has a tensioner that's pushing in sort of on one side. So you can imagine it's sort of, um, it's, it's running around and then up pushed in with the tensioner. And then when you, uh, when the variable valve timing comes in, it actually moves that tensioner down. So it keeps the same tension on the chain the whole time, but by moving it from pushing from the bottom from the, to now pushing from the top, it turns both the cams separately from each other. So you still have, uh, they're not skipping a tooth or anything like that, but but they actually have changed the uh, the valve timing. So that's how that works. Um, so interesting for, for my head anyway, to get my head around these things. Uh, this engine has four knock sensors. Um, different from many other engines, uh, all the other engines that I've worked with, I was trying to work out the uh, engine firing order or the engine, um, I should say, cylinder numbering. And... Um, on the 911s and on the Audi, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is how it would be. On this engine, it's one, two, three, four, jump over, five is at the back, six, seven, eight coming forward. Um, so again, getting my head around that, but that's all, uh, that's all reasonably sorted. Uh, it also has the uh, cam angle sensors are mounted to the, uh, the the top of the rocker cover on the sides, which uh, most other engines I've seen them been on the end of the cams. Um, so anyway, those are the main parts of the engine that I need to connect up. They're all in here. You may be asking, why am I using the Ferrari wiring loom? Um, 
Yes, it is probably valuable and probably worth uh, potentially selling. But by the time I got more connectors for all of the uh, the separate things, um, the coil packs, etc., the only thing that I'm not really using is the um, is the airflow meters I will no longer be using because I'll be using a map sensor and the injectors. The injectors I won't be using because uh, I've changed the injectors over. I've got different injectors on this. So, um, but I can keep reusing the existing wiring and just uh, and just deep in these and wire in my own injectors. So the basic layout is here. So uh, now is the, um, the scary bit. I've got everything where I need it. Now I need to cut off the tail of this loom and then um, remove the uh, couple of different bits that I don't need and also prepare for a couple of bits I do need because the Ferrari originally had a crank angle sensor that was on the flywheel at the back. I'm not running that. I, as many of you saw, I made this uh, trigger wheel on the crank and, uh, and, and made this sort of um, this boss up here that's uh, my crank angle sensor now. And so I need to wire that into my loom as well. A little bit more to do, but um, I think we'll get it sorted. All right, so you saw I've uh, cut up my factory loom, which was, um, yeah, a little bit daunting. Obviously, uh, it's a very expensive wiring loom, but we now have a big mess of wires here, and uh, we also have the connectors for the Link ECU here. Now, I've uh, taped off at the length where the connectors are going to be inside the cabin to go from the ECU, which is in the firewall, through to where my bulkhead connects are gonna be. So I know that length there um, that I want. And now it's a matter of trying to wire up the link. Now, um, it seems like a really daunting task. And those who will have watched the, uh, uh, the 911, Harry 911 series or the Rockster will have seen how I sort of went through it. Particularly on the Rockster, Again, I did the similar sort of thing that as I'm doing here, is I kept the existing loom, and um, using these uh, these bulkhead connectors, I think it's a really good way of um, of wiring an ECU. So let me just cover a couple of things before we uh, before I start sort of talking about how to get into this. The basic tools you need for uh, for, for tackling this sort of stuff. Um, a good little set of uh, side cutter pliers. I like these things. Um, Nice for, for trimming trimming the wires. Um, some wire strippers, good uh, wire strippers. These are nice and quick and uh, simple. And um, particularly when you're talking about these bulkhead connectors, you need the proper Deutsch um, pliers. These things have four pins that come together through on the inside and pinch the wire all the way around, so they make a really good crimp, really quick and easy. You just sort of plop the uh, the connector in, uh, stick the wire in, crimp, you're done. Uh, and it makes a really good connection, and that's what you need to be able to uh, fit these bulkhead connectors up, and that is fantastic. You also want a couple of uh, Deutsch de-pinning tools. This is a de-pinning tool, so you just slip it over the wire, slide it into the back of the uh, connector, and then you can pull it out when you inevitably make a mistake. And it's quite easy to, uh, to do that. Next thing is with these connectors. I have made the mis this mistake as recently as on the Rockstar. You wanna make sure you put the pins in the right way around. And what I mean is uh, when you mount these in the car, you have one side that is screwed in and, uh, and clamped into the, uh, the, the bulkhead and is solid, and the other side that unclips. Make sure that this unclipping bit is the engine bay side. So you pin this to the engine and pin this to the bulkhead so that when in the engine bay, you can just go unclip and take it off. Otherwise, it's not the end of the world, but you have to unclip from in the cabin and then unscrew it to take it out. It's not the way it's designed. The way it's designed is, yeah. So tip for young players. The next thing you need is in the Link ECU, you've got the, uh, the quick start guide. And in here, <clears throat> it basically gives you 
um, a pinout diagram of these two connectors. So what every wire does and where it needs to go. And they're, they're nicely labeled and uh, it makes a lot of sense once you start going through and you sort of go, oh, okay, so that's injector four, injector three, injector two, injector one, for example. And when you go through those things and you sort of go, oh, okay, so that wire goes to that injector and uh, so forth. So you need this. Uh, and on the previous page, it's actually got a, um, a list where you write down, for example, you've got um, lots of auxiliary outputs, which could be for different things. So you want to make sure you write down where those wires are going as you go so that you've got a reference for it later. Another thing that I have done, um, I did it on the Rockster, just uh, scribbled it on a piece of paper, but uh, this time I've actually spent a little bit more time did a very quick little uh, chart so that I've got my, my bulkhead connector, I've got the number of all the pins, there's 47 pins in this bulkhead connector, and then I've got a column that just says color of the wire from the ECU and color of the wire from the engine and what the component is. So if I go injector one, I know, you know, injector, it might be a blue wire from the engine and from the ECU, it might be a red with a blue trace or something like that. So I go sort of red, blue, blue so I know on one side of the bulkhead connector it's going to be the the blue wire from the engine and the red blue wire goes into the other other side from the ECU know what it all is I can reference it later if I've got problems if I'm troubleshooting you can go back to this so you've got your stuff so that's the basic the basic bits and pieces uh, you need for starting the wiring now, I know looking at um, a bunch of 50 wires cut off and looking at these wiring looms, it's really daunting. And I'm with you. When I first started looking at these things, I started freaking out going, oh my God, how can you, there's no way you can get your head around this. It's too hard. I'm not going to do it. It's not too hard. Honestly, if you can... if you can wire in a car stereo, you can definitely do this. It's really... It's taking one thing at a time. Most of these components and sensors and stuff like that on this car generally have a, a, a power, a ground, and, um, and a, signal, a trigger wire, a signal wire from the ECU. So it's, it's that sort of simple. So it's just a matter of starting on the first thing. I like to uh, sort of do the, the bulk of the wires first. That's just how I choose to do it. Um, so for me, I think I'm going to start with the core packs and we're going to start with core pack number one and let's start wiring up a bulkhead connector. All right, I almost forgot that uh, another thing you would probably use is a multimeter. I'm just setting it to see if we're making a circuit. Standard, this is reading one. When it completes a circuit, you can see that there is very little resistance there. So um, basically what, what I'm doing is I've unplugged coil pack number one and um, realizing that my wiring diagram that I downloaded, the wire colors aren't matching up what is on this particular um, chart. So the way to go around and check which wires are which, a uh, simple way for starters, I've taken the boot off so I can see the colors of the wires on the connector to try and match up with the colors of the wires on the loom and then what I found is that all of the uh, all of the coils have a green, a black, and a different color wire. So this different color wire is obviously the trigger goes to the ECU. That's the only one that actually needs to go to the ECU. The other two are one is 12 volt power. The other one is a uh, as a ground. So I've gone through and seen that the wires actually change somewhere back in this part of the loom before they get to here. So. If there's no black and no solid green wire, how do you find it? I stick a probe in the end of one of the wires and go, oh, okay, that's the wire, that's where it goes to. So I know that the black wires in here are the ground and it turns into the brown wires here. I've done the same thing on the green. It turns to this green black. So they all shared and joined together in further in the loom. So that makes it easy for me. I just need to connect these up and all the powers and all the grounds are connected to the coil packs. And then I just have to find each individual signal wire. 
All right, so I've got my first crimp on and uh, I'm just about to connect up the, uh, the bulkhead connector. So I've selected the correct side. So this is, the, uh, this is the detachable side that I want to be in the engine bay. So I've got that bit right. And um, I've actually got the female pins on this side. So um, that is all correct. To actually use these things, they're if, if you get very close, so you can see here on this face that there are numbers against every single hole but this is, the, uh, this is not the side where you plug the, the wires in, you actually plug it in this side. So you can actually see, you start in the middle hole here, and there's a little line there showing up to the next hole. So the next pin would go into that hole, and then there's a little line there, so the next pin goes in that hole, that hole, and works its way around. So you just follow these lines, so some of these get a bit weird, it goes from this hole for example, around to that hole, but as long as you follow that rotation, it goes well, because it doesn't number every hole, it numbers every 10. It does get complicated when you start getting a lot of wires in there, but if you do it one wire at a time and do both sides together is the way I find to do it. So I'll do this uh, wire here coming from the e engine, but then I'll also do the corresponding wire coming from the ECU into the other connector and keep it like that and it, it goes reasonably smoothly and Write down every single one as you go, otherwise you will get lost. All right, so we have all of the injectors wired up, individually numbered, and uh, they've been terminated, so that's all good. Uh, just to match in with everything else, we also have the core packs all wired up, so that is all um, the, the drives to the individual cylinders are now wrapped up, and that's a big chunk of these wires. Um, obviously, there are there are a few systems on the engine to work through, but it's really not that complicated. I know it, it looks it, but particularly this Ferrari engine is quite simple and straightforward. Um, it does have four knock sensors, which um, once you know what a knock sensor looks like, you can sort of see them, it's pretty obvious. There's four of them on this engine. It's got uh, the other basic systems to tell the uh, computer where the engine is in its cycle. So you've got your crank angle sensor and your cam angle sensors um, to connect up. You've got a couple of temperature sensors. So you've got uh, water temperature and uh, inlet air temperature and also a man manifold air pressure sensors that I've got to set up, so a, a map sensor. Um, and then the throttle blades, and I think off the top of my head, that is the bulk of the things to do. But we don't have time to do it in this episode because uh, even though it doesn't feel like I've got a lot done, it doesn't seem like, I mean, there's definitely not a lot I can really film on this, but um, it's been a lot of work getting through there, just methodically taking my time to get it right. Anyway, uh, that is it for this week. So I think that means it's time for Fun Facts with Mrs. Jeff. Hey guys, the Ferrari 330 TRI LM was started out as a 250 TRI, which was bodied as a spider by Fantuzzi. TRI, of course, stands for Testarossa, with the I standing for Independent Rear Suspension. It was crashed during a practice in the 1960 Targo Florio, but was rebuilt with parts from other wrecks and ended up competing in the 1960 24 Hours of Le Mans, but retired early on the Sunday with a broken drive shaft. In 1961, the car went on to finish second in the 24 hours of Sebring, the 1,000 kilometers of Nürburgring, and the 24 hours of Le Mans. 1962 saw a rule change moving the engine limit from three liters to four liters. So the chassis was stripped down and rebuilt using a new four liter Colombo V12 making 390 horsepower. With Phil Hill behind the wheel, this car went on to win the 1962 24 Hours of Le Mans overall and was the last front-engined car to ever do it. It started on pole back at Le Mans the following year with Roger Penske at the wheel, 
but it crashed out and this chassis was finally retired from racing. There was only one 330 TRI LM ever built and it was the last competition car to bear the Testarossa name. All right, a, uh, another wiring episode. I know they're not generally the most interesting, but uh, I really enjoy it. I'm really starting to, I, I, I find it hard even hearing myself that I'm actually enjoying wiring, but yeah. I'm, now I'm understanding it more. It actually, it's not as daunting as it, uh, as it originally appeared. And it just, uh, it, it's, it makes sense. It's kind of like a car version of Stockholm syndrome, isn't it? Yeah, mate. The wiring has drawn you in. Yeah, that's, it's, it's <laughs> sucking me into it. But it, uh, it's actually, uh, it's, it's quite sort of therapeutic, just sitting there working away one little sensor, one little component at a time. And um, it gets there, but it's time consuming. So, um, please oh. like, subscribe, follow Jeff on Patreon if you want to help him out with his meditation. Yep. And get to watch the videos. Yes, a day, day before everyone else. Yes. So, um, all right. And uh, follow me on Facebook and Instagram, Home Built by Jeff, everywhere. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye, guys. See you, guys. 1960 Le Mans, 24 hours. No, Le Mans, 24 hours of Le Mans. 1,000 yep. kilometers of Nürburgring. Nürburgring. And the Nürburgring. Carl went on to finish second in the... What well, the first one? And the engine was rebuilt. No. The engine was not rebuilt. It's a new engine. And rebuilt. Rebuilt. You and wrote rebuilt. the chassis was stripped and rebuilt. The engine was not rebuilt. Oh. In 90s... Yeah. In 1960 car... No, 1960 <laughs> car.